Um, thanks everyone for joining us um, this, uh, for this webinar on COVID-19 and kind of preparing for the future. Uh, hopefully, we all walk away learning something from this. Uh, I know it's been crazy times for a lot of us. Things are moving fast and uh, there's a little bit of a feeling like we're walking around in the dark a bit and um, we can activate today our collective brain and hopefully walk away learning something. I, for one, am just thankful that it was a reason to put on a collared shirt uh, and comb my hair. I've been walking around looking like Nick Nolte's mugshot recently, so this is kind of nice. Um, yeah, the world has been greatly impacted by the virus. We know it. Uh, the ad agency, marketing agency, other businesses, no exception. Um, our hope today is to spark some good conversation around the current situation as we look towards reopening. Um, I've set my kids up with lunch and a movie in another room and hopefully that'll buy me at least uh, an hour before they come knocking. So we're going to try to keep this to a tight hour and, and roll out at 1.30. Uh, I'm your moderator today, Dave Larson. I'm the director, a director and co-founder at Early Media. And we have a fantastic group of professionals on our panel today. Let me jump in and introduce, do a quick introduction. We've got Matt McDermott, Associate VP of Creative at ID5. ID5 is an integrated marketing and social design agency for brands on a mission. They help clients in education, health, nonprofits, and government make a positive dent in the world. We've got Jess Brown, creative director at TBC. TBC is a full service agency that turns customer insights into effective media and creative solutions. We've got Kara Redman, CEO of Backroom. Backroom is a brand and activation agency that creates brand identity systems, messaging frameworks, and websites for bold companies that inspire people. And Ashleen Larson, Director of Public Relations and Social Media for Planet. Planet is a strategic, digitally-minded agency that leads revolutions for national and global clients, whether, whether that's through a variety of media channels, PR, social, and the next big thing, if it isn't bold, creative, and smart, well, they're just not doing their job. Uh, and last but not least, we've got Darren Durlach, my brother from another mother, a director and co-founder of Early Light Media. Early Light Media is a production company that puts social responsibility first using video as a medium to capture the interconnectivity as humans in a way that is both beautiful and relatable. Which was written by Kara Redman. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So welcome everyone, thanks for coming, thanks for joining. A uh, couple ground rules before we get started real quick. This is meant to be a Q&A conversation style thing. No presentations were, uh, were created for this. Um, we want, we encourage, we hope everyone ask questions, please. We want you to leave here uh, finding something out and feeling informed. So if you have questions, the only thing we ask is open up that chat box at the bottom, type your question in just to kind of keep some order. I'll ask the question. With that said though, if you have a particularly complicated question or something that requires a lot of context, we're happy to open up the mic to you. Just let me know, give me a heads up in the q and I'll get to everybody in order as they come in. Okay, so uh, please ask questions. We wanna to get to them and we wanna hopefully spark some good dialogue. Now. A um, couple real quick updates just on what's going on just to kind of level the playing field. Um, as of this morning, I think Maryland had about, I don't know, a little over 26,000. Actually, I do know I've got the numbers. A little over 26,000 confirmed cases. We're at a stay-at-home order still, and the governor is slowly beginning to roll out his roadmap to recovery, a plan to kind of get things moving again uh, that lays out low, medium, high risk uh, initiatives. Um, I think there's still a ton more to come. This is obviously a fast changing situation um, and we're all trying to figure things out. So with that said, we'll kick it off with our first question. Um, this one is a group question, but we'll go down and give everybody a chance to answer. Uh, the question is, how has this situation impacted your company and your ability to serve your clients? Matt, we'll start off with you. Sure. Thanks for having me, everybody. It's good to fake see your faces. Um, I think outside looking in, it probably doesn't look much different for our clients. Um, they still have complete access to us. 
Uh, we've made the transition remote about as seamlessly as anybody could because we do have a number of staff uh, located around the country and even out of the country. Um, we just had to make sure that the tech was there, that the maturity within the, the folks was there. Um, but we are definitely seeing some uncertainty from clients. We see people talking about pulling budgets back and watching every dollar more closely. Um, because we focus very heavily on measurement with the, not only what we create, but also the way we flight it and the way we measure it, or it's, I think it's still business as usual. I think they just appreciate it a little bit more now. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think that all makes sense. Jess, what about you over at TVC? What are you guys saying? So I think to echo what Matt said, it is in some ways a lot of business as usual for our clients. They're still seeing the same level of engagement with us. Um, I do think they, you know, oftentimes tend to be a bit more appreciative. I will say for us, the one thing we've had to do, even though we were fairly accustomed to having some folks remote on a regular basis, We've had to identify um, kind of day parts, right? That became these like no-fly zones where people were allowed to sort of tend to their lives, work, children, whatever it is throughout the day as an organization, um, just to let people kind of feel uh, a little more natural in this kind of constant work from home situation. Um, so that's one thing we've seen. And then I think we've organically seen some teams outside of our traditional status meetings and team group meetings you know, early morning check-ins, right? Before the day really starts going, I feel like we've gone from being an agency of night owls to early birds in some weird way. Um, but all in all, it is kind of business as usual. Kara, what about you over at Backroom with, you know, you guys do a lot with websites, brand identity, messaging. What are you guys finding? Um, we really, the first maybe week and a half of the shutdown found ourselves sort of forced into this mobilized crisis communications mode, right? And um, there's a lot of empathy on our team and, you know, our question, and I, I think this is true for everybody on this panel. I know you guys too, Alan, is like, how can we help? Um, you know, when you're suddenly pushed into a position of like, hey, we're not suffering. It is kind of, you know, business as usual. We haven't taken too much of a hit in terms of ongoing revenue. So it becomes, what's our little slice of the pie that we have that's our gift that we can give to the people around us? So we were offering free social posts to the restaurants and community um, folks around us that needed help just kind of promoting, like we need gift card sales right now just to kind of stay afloat. Um, so we um, just, I think really had a neat opportunity to see what we're able to create and do when we're under that kind of pressure and able to help the people that we care about, which you know are people in our lives, but also our clients, the people that we work with. Um, but I think it's really made us take a step back um, with our clients in terms of the types of things that they're doing, right? So it's, hey, do we pause our paid media campaigns or don't we? Is that sensitive? Is that insensitive? Um, we need to keep our lights on. We have services that still help people right now, but is it too soon? There's just so much uncertainty. So, um, you know, we've really just seen that a lot of our clients and, and ourselves have just turned into a lot more human and there's a lot more like raw authenticity, not to steal some language from your brand, but um, it, it's, it's more of a how can, we, how can we be humans in this and show empathy and that we get each other and really be helpful um, versus continuing to promote, promote, promote. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Actually, you know, you guys, you're, you're doing a lot of PR and social over at Planet. What, uh, what are you guys finding right now? So I don't want to repeat what a lot of people have said. We've been completely remote since March 16th. I think the client experience has largely been unchanged. Many of our clients aren't even in Maryland. So that's, that's one thing that's a positive. Um, and I think the thing that we've been noticing is, um, so Planet's about 60 people. We're a very culture-driven environment. And so a lot of people want to see each other. Like that's why they work at Planet is because they like seeing the people they work with. Um, and so our challenge has been, how do we keep that culture going um, with employee morale? And how do we support parents who are um, like me and Dave working from home with our children, nipping at our heels? And how do we support the, um, the younger people who maybe are living alone and feel really disconnected? Um, so we've been doing, you know, Obviously, virtual happy hours has like become a big thing, but um, we have a culture committee that started this like pay it forward thing where um, we're sending little gifts to each other and just trying to keep, you know, a bit of that planet culture going virtually um, to remind people why they work 
for the company, which is a lot of it has to do with the people we work with. Um, and that's like a big part of what makes Planet, you know, what it is. Yeah, and uh, you know, and obviously, Darren, we've we've seen some changes on our end. Why don't we touch a little bit too? What what are some of the big things that we've noticed during this time period for for early light media? Sure. Um, well, it's become. I, I think that you know, all all of us in these agencies, uh, we are relationship driven, right? I mean, I, I think that all of the agencies here probably don't spend a ton of time traditionally marketing themselves. You just add value to the relationships and you try to, you try to um, communicate well and provide solutions to, to people that you work with. And I think for us, um, we found that the relationships that we've, um, that, that have really flourished over the, the years, some of our clients have been working with us since we started seven years ago. And it's those relationships that has, have helped us get through this um, and trying to find ways to help them. Right. And so obviously out of any of the groups here, our work requires at least half of our work requires physical presence. Right. We have to we have to film and we have to shoot. And so um, we have really in a cool way, I think, as a company, just been brainstorming a lot about how do we help people right now, even though we're a video marketing company and a lot of our work is video production. How do we help people? And I think so it's come down to coming with solutions like. Um, going back to the tricks of the trade, like, you know, digging into our archives and repurposing content that we've already filmed, you know, massive archives for some of our clients, um, going to animation, graphics work, um, you know, with digital, there's so many ways to create content without being in person, especially now where Zoom video is becoming the bar <laughs> for video quality. Fortunately and unfortunately, um, I think fortunately because, you know, it actually opens the door for a lot of people to, to use video and to create educational series and things like that that don't require high-end production. Um, and unfortunately, just because, you know, we take pride in making pretty video. That's great. And I think that's a good jumping off point. Um, just sticking with you, Darren, we've got our first question uh, in the chat box from Dana Discordia. Uh, I think I'm saying that right. Discordia over at Gin and Burger. What things will need to be in place before you and your clients will be comfortable allowing some live action shooting on stage or locations? Well, that's a good question. That's something that we've wrestled with since the beginning. Uh, when we first, when this first started and everything completely shut down, um, or the week before it completely shut down, we offered free leadership message vi videos for, for clients just to, you know, be a megaphone and say, hey, the avalanche is coming, get out of the way. <laughs> um, and, you know, since then, everything's kind of been this sort of like, should we shoot, should we not shoot? Um, you know, some of that comes down to legal advice from our, from, from lawyers. Um, and some of that comes down to just being ethical and practical, um, right? So right now, you know, it, it's obviously a phased thing. So um, as we learn more from Governor Hogan and uh, leadership, government leadership, um, you know, when it comes to loosening up to where 10 people are allowed to crowd again, and that's acceptable. Um, you know, most of most video shoots, uh, you have kind of these these bigger commercial shoots that can require bigger crews, but uh, the bulk of video trends is, is going towards digital. And, you know, with digital videos, and when I say digital, I mean, um, like, explainer videos and testimonials and social and educational series and web series, all that can be shot in less, with less than 10 people. So I think once that starts to open up, it, it opens up a lot of doors. Um, and I think you're gonna see a lot more masks on set. You're gonna see uh, there's, you know, hand sanitizers not going away anytime soon. Um, and then, you know, probably some audio techniques, whereas we might put a, a, a lav mic on somebody before, we might use a boom mic, stuff like that practical things. But um, right now, I think we're trying to kind of wait to see how the energy shifts. That's perfect. And, and for those following along in the chat section, um, Paper Camera just posted uh, an article that she found helpful on um, how to work on set. I haven't seen that article yet, so I'll check that out after this. But if you guys wanted to um, 
click on it. It's, it's in the chat section. We have another question from Justin, Justin Kawanaki. Um, how are you advising your clients in terms of long-term and short-term planning strategy and budgeting? Matt, I'll kick it over to you uh, for this question. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Boomer. I, that's, that's a rookie move right there. Um, as far as how we approach it, there's a couple things, and part of it is the way we set it up to begin with. Uh, before we take on a client, we do a pre-mortem. A lot of times what you'll see is people doing post-mortems, what went wrong. What we're doing is we're assuming stuff is going to go wrong, and we, we try to spec out every single possibility. So things like uh, budget changes, um, losing key contacts, uh, clients ghosting you, all of those things are kind of built in um, ahead of time. So for those of you who haven't already planned for that, that doesn't help much. But moving forward, uh, at least for budgets and creative, what we're doing is we're already starting to have conversations about how are we going to stretch those budgets that we already have funded? How are we going to stretch those longer? What can we do? What can we adjust? Our account team is really good at measuring that, um, whether it is the media buy or uh, the labor uh, funds. Um, we're also just setting up more frequent calls. Uh, depending on the type of engagement we have, some clients are really leaning heavily on us to, to help them figure it out and sometimes just keep them from touching the stove. But in other situations, um, they really kind of already have a, an operating procedure and it's just, it's up to us to work as smoothly with them as possible. Hey Dave, uh, I think you're muted uh, for the last 20 seconds. Oh my goodness. Uh, now, now it's just a cascading effect. We're all just going to be doing this. Um, I was saying that this is obviously a big question. Um, let's, uh, you know, get another perspective. Kara, I'm, I'm curious on your end of things, how are you advising your clients in terms of, you know, planning strategy and budgeting, things like that? Do you have anything to add to Matt's answer? No, Matt has a great point of like preparation. I think just for most of us who've been in the industry of client services for a long time, we just know that prevention is the best medicine right so just setting up that foundation of success and and doing the risk assessments for sure um but really it's case by case basis i mean you know we, we've had clients come in and go like okay we have no idea what's happening next and you don't either and we just said hey let's pull your paid media budget all the way down to like the bare minimum just to like keep something going see what happens um, and we have really moved to a month to month sort of planning for some of our clients that are on that more lead gen brand awareness, like campaigning level, um, because we have no idea normally what human behavior is going to be through digital media. And now we have this additional wrench of like, we have no idea if people have an appetite for things. If some target audiences that we have for our clients are worried about if they can pay their rent or not versus buying products. So it's really, um, you know, just a huge testing environment with a big risk of turning folks off. Um, so our, the, the budget recommendations that we're making are really like, what's the impact that you want to have? What's the risk associated with getting a certain message out? Um, are you being tone deaf to your audience's specific needs? Um, but making sure also we don't just kind of go away, right? There's this happy medium and how do we stay in touch with our customers throughout this, but at the same time, not look like we're self-promoting or capitalizing on you know, a really horrible situation um, to get our name out there. So um, it's really case by case and it's, it's depending on what each client needs to kind of stay afloat um, and what their customers need from them right now. Uh, that's perfect. And, you know, Jess uh, Brown, how, how are you guys, are, have you guys shifted your approach to creative when dealing with your clients? Is there any, you know, how, are you advising them or do you have new ideas in terms of how they interact with audience. How are you guys, how does this change your approach to creative? Sure, I would say it's, it's actually, there's probably like a- there's Well, I'm on this uh, Zoom thing that Jesse- <laughs> Hi, Joe. Uh, so the, um, I would say first and foremost, we had those, that kind of crisis management right off the bat, right? So there were, unfortunately for some of our clients, they were about to push go 
on major national campaigns that had creative, in some cases, even involving Olympic athletes, right, that were about to go live and days before, uh, you know, everything kind of went kablooey. So there was that immediate need to be nimble and triage a lot of the creative work that was in market. I think what we saw in that first run was some creativity coming from unexpected places, right? We were able to kind of hand the camera over to, um, or maybe their cell phone over, more appropriately said, to um, you know, athletes in that particular case. And we saw a lot of the, the talent and the folks that we had been working with you know, once upon a time on set, stepping up and layering in their own personality to kind of send it back to us and edit new spots. Um, and create new executions that are appropriate for right now um, and will get us over the hump. I think long term, what we're starting to think about from a creative um, strategy standpoint is not thinking about this situation going away. So everything that we're doing now, we're thinking about it in terms of scale. Is it appropriate three months from now, six months from now, eight months from now? And that has a lot to do with staying authentic to whatever that brand stands for, the, the product and the services that are offered, what their relevance is at that time, and trying to not create a situation in which we're producing too much creative now, but in six months, nine months, a year, will be outdated. So trying to think of the, the creative production budget as something that has to live a lot longer, and so we have to be very, very calculated in the type of messaging um, and really executional direction we go in. You know, it seems to me that, you know, as this goes on, I totally agree that I think this is, you know, not going away quickly. Um, we certainly all probably have varying levels of optimism in terms of when maybe the train will get chugging forward again. Um, and certainly we've all gone through various stages. Ashleen, I'm wondering from a PR level, um, you know, in the beginning, it was a lot about crisis, maybe communication, how companies are dealing with this quickly, but how has the messaging changed as we've kind of, we're now in what, week eight, I think, uh, week nine, something like that? I don't know. Week eight, uh, how has things progressed? How have things changed and, and how do you see them changing moving forward? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think like uh, many of all of you probably initially we were all in crisis mode with our clients. Um, so the messaging was very much reactive, even though we had crisis plans for many of our clients in place. Um, this isn't a situation we had anticipated, you know, the word unprecedented has been used so many times. I don't want to say it again, but it really was like no one has ever seen anything like this. Um, and we're still working through some crisis situations with clients. Some of our clients have to announce every time um, one of their staff members gets diagnosed. They're still closing store locations. They're having to make you know, media statements about that. And so we are still working through that with some of our clients. Most of our clients, I would say, have shifted into this kind of stabilization mode with their messaging where they are trying to figure out, like Jess said, how long is this going to last and what what is relevant now and you know what will be relevant for the foreseeable future in terms of what we're saying. Um, we have seen this backlash with um, people don't want to be sold to necessarily, so, but that doesn't mean you stop marketing, you know? So it's, it's this finding this balance between telling people, you know, we have something to offer you and maybe shifting it to the way the company is supporting you in your new normal, you know, whether that's at home, whether that's, you know, through social distancing, um, obviously certain products are not going to be able to be really heavily advertised right now. Travel, you know, you, I don't know how you advertise travel right now. Thank God I don't have any travel clients, but I think just being sensitive to the messaging that's appropriate for this new normal is, is super important. Um, we've turned off all of our automatic like social media posts just so that every day we look at it with a fresh eye, like given the information today does this post still make sense to go live? Because it's when you start having these automatic things, and I think that's where a lot of companies got caught early on was they had campaigns that they pressed go on and it now the next day felt highly insensitive and was like a huge blunder for the company. Um, so I think right now we're just stabilizing, we're figuring out what's relevant for now for, with what we know, and then the next phase that I'm anticipating is going to be this kind of growth innovation phase where, you know, how has thing, how have things shifted 
And how are you still going to continue growing as a company or, or reaching your customers in new ways? Um, and that's obviously to be seen, but um, that's what I look forward to next is kind of this innovation that's going to come out of all of this. And hopefully, you know, that'll kind of pull us all out <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Uh, Ashley, you mentioned something that uh, I just thought was interesting. It's like people don't want the product advertising right now or like the normal things. But I, I, I saw a LinkedIn post a couple of days ago in which someone said, I saw a Subaru commercial or something like that. And it didn't say anything about COVID-19. And it was just so nice. Like, where, where do you guys stand on like the, is it okay to laugh now? Like, can we just, is it refreshing for people to see some normalcy? Yeah, I'm just, I, and I'm sure the creative folks will have their own viewpoint on this too. I'm looking at Jess right now, but um, I, I think people are a little tired of the, in this uncertain time, like that like opening, but you still need to be sensitive. So it's like, I think just looking at things from a, in the sense of like what's authentic to your brand is, it's so cliche to say that, but it, it's true. If you're just saying, you know, what would this brand say? Um, we're working on a, on a home building product campaign right now. And it's just about how home is important. That's all we're trying to say. Just like home is important right now. And it's not gonna talk about COVID. It's not gonna talk about how scary it is. It's just like, hey, we're all stuck at home and home is really important right now. So I think just figuring out where your brand coincides with what's going on in like an authentic, sensitive way is, is important. Yeah, and, and, and kind of sticking with that, you know, you guys kind of touched upon it. Uh, Jess, I'll, I'll kick it over to you since you were kind of message, uh, mentioned, but, you know, there obviously has been a lot of attention on a lot of ad agencies kind of going the similar route. We're all in this together, that type of thing. I mean, what are you guys finding? Are you guys starting leaning away from that messaging? Um, what are you turning your attention towards now? Generally speaking, I mean, we've not, we have not encouraged uh, many of our clients to go that route. That doesn't mean we haven't encouraged tremendous amounts of sensitivity and empathy in terms of how we're messaging things. And we've had to make some very specific pivots, like I said earlier, in creative that was about to go live or had just gone live. Um, but we really haven't gone so far as to um, lead with an unprecedented time message or, you know, that we're all here for each other sentiment, because frankly, it didn't make sense for any of the clients that, you know, we were providing service to. We have some CPG brands that, um, you know, for them, they're still, in some cases, they're providing food. It's food. So there's no real reason why we can't be aware of what's happening, the circumstances around us, and continue to market and advertise their products um, without getting caught in a strange place. I think for us, we have the benefit of that. I'm sure there are certain brands, particularly in travel, and some of those, you know, blue chip brands where it was kind of a moment of what do we do now? Um, we didn't see this coming. But for us, we've really been able to steer clear of um, some of those cliches and just focus on an authentic message that was right for that client, um, dialing back the media where it's appropriate, um, and really moving forward with that approach. Uh, and, and, and speaking with, uh, talking about approach, um, you know, Matt, I'm, I'm kicking it over to you now. You know, have you guys found with your clients and with, with is, there, is there an audience, or I'm sorry, is there a, a channel in which audience are responding best during this time? Like, are you finding a lot of ground in terms of email or, or social campaigns, paid ads, TV, like things like that? Obviously, production has been halted, so I'm sure, like, getting new commercials is a little bit more challenging, but are you guys seeing any change in channels in which you, you're getting more response from audiences than others? I don't know that I'm necessarily seeing a change in channels. I think the channels that have continued to deliver results from a direct response standpoint, and uh, particularly from a measurability standpoint, continue to be search, social, email. Uh, if anything, those are going to be some of the channels people are gonna double down on, brands of all sizes, because they are going to be looking to scrutinize their media buys a lot more. They're going to need to be able to, even if it's a brand campaign, be able to measure that that dollar that was so hard earned is going to perform and that they have something to point back to because you figure they're laying off hundreds of people, some of these larger brands, and they owe it to not only their workforce, but I guess 
to a lesser extent to their stockholders to be able to show that they're able to move the needle still. I think everyone is going to be pulling back to some extent. There's the old adage that um, in times of uh, crisis or recession, that's when you should be adding to your marketing dollars to get a leg up. And I very rarely see that happen. Um, and I think in this case, we're going to find that that's going to be uh, a real challenge. Yeah, I mean, budgets, budget shrinking, certainly, you know, um, we've seen the impact there. You know, Darren, maybe you can touch a little bit upon that. How's video marketing changing with all of the, you know, budgets being adjusted as this unfolds? There's a lot of unknowns. What, what are you finding? I think you're mute, bro. Thanks, bro. Um, <laughs> I think Matt made a great point uh, that, you know, people should be increasing their marketing dollars. I think from a, from a video marketing standpoint, prior to COVID-19, everything was going digital anyways, right? So um, that was already on a sharp incline. Um, and then, so, you know, one of the, one of the tools that we happen to do that is 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 only all that when things go digital all that does is um make video more important and the reason is because um so like there's a i was just reading a quote from from salesforce that was saying that most customers go through half of the buying process independently without reaching out to the company they're interested in and so what that tells me is that people want to learn on their own they're a little bit less likely to um, call a sales team and so um, you know if anything has been changed by COVID-19 it's it and from a marketing standpoint from my standpoint is um, that digital is only becoming more accelerated and that video is a big part of that and uh, so you know whether that's it used to be that in a sales funnel you know the video would just sort of be part of the awareness portion you'd make a commercial and you'd send it out to the masses and that would send them to your company and you talk to a salesperson but these days uh you know video plays a part in the entire sales funnel process um which i'd like to call a story funnel if i can uh so i think from a video stand standpoint um you know if you think of it like a story funnel you have act one which is awareness um, just like in a film or a play, that's the kickoff event. And then act two, you have consideration. That's sort of the journey. And then act three is conversion, which is the, the resolution in a three act play. And so from a video standpoint as storytellers, really this just gives us the ability to tell a more interactive story from beginning to end um, with video, um, whether it's, you know, whether, you know, and, and videos that you can do yourself, right? So like, um, you can do an educational series using your webcam, right? And it's, it, as we talked about earlier, it's even become more acceptable um, with Zoom uh, and, and the way things are going. Um, and then where usually you wanna pay more for video would be when you kind of identify those tried and true messages along your story funnel, um, like, you know, for te testimonials or explainers or things like that, that, you know, are very, brand heavy and uh, don't change over the period of 18 months, 24 months. Um, so, I, so I think from a video marketing standpoint, it's only gonna go up. It's just a matter of budgets going down and, and, and what can you spend your money on? Um, and I think uh, it's, it's, it's a time when if you can, you don't wanna cut those ad dollars or those marketing dollars because it is the time to get ahead. And like Google, Google search, like Matt was talking about, is actually cheaper now. Right, so there's it's an auction system, so it's cheaper because less people are advertising on. So now's the time to do it. Get that money where it matters. That's right, Kara. I'm wondering from you, you know, have you through your journeys through all this, have you seen a brand out there that's doing it particularly well? Some someone that stands out as uh, someone who's really been nailing it through this entire thing. I do, and if you don't mind, I want to expand on some points that. Darren Please. and Matt just made too, because I love the like, hearing words like Matt's talking about doubling down on social and email and doing more interactive things. And that's something that's really cool that we've seen. And I think this is a theme sort of across COVID is like the rules don't really apply. There's a lot more flexibility. Everyone's kind of easier on each other. And we're seeing things like if we have to double down on social, right? What does that mean? 
it's look at all the text you're seeing in Instagram social posts all of a sudden, right? Like this whole rule of like, it has to be very visual and then the caption has all the information and here are the hashtags is all gone, right? Because we're working with limited resources. And so we're having to get really creative with here are the channels that we really have our audience's attention with, here are the messages that we have. And so we're able to do things that we weren't able to do before. The amount of animation that my team has done in the past month is probably more than we did last year because we're having to get more creative with the types of content that we're putting out versus, hey, the whole world is our oyster and which channel do we choose? We don't have that option anymore. So, um, you know, I, I think the same things that Darren's kind of seeing with like doing more interactive stuff on your own and when do you choose premium versus doing more things with the tools that you already have, um, it's, content has kind of become everybody's playground and it's a really cool thing to see. So I, I wanted to touch on that. Um, and I think just in terms of brands who are doing things well and who are not, like, I think that any time of crisis, which is what we're in right now, um, crisis makes people and brands are people more of what they already are right it's not like oh this thing has changed me the people who already are in business or show up to work every day because they feel themselves of service to other people find themselves called to be of more service people who are constantly looking at their bottom line and how can i cut this cut that fire that person get this person out of maternity leave so i don't have to pay them that mindset becomes more of that and like protecting your little squirrely acorns so i think what's neat is the brands that we've already trusted are doing things that make us trust them more. And I'll just throw a couple out just from both personal experience and just cool things that we see our clients doing. Like I, we're all playing games more, I think, on our phones right now, at least for those of us who are not locked in with children. Sorry, the rest of you, it's great over here. <laughs> um, uh, there's, there's a game that I play called Two Dots, and it's just a real stupid connect the dots game. I don't know if anybody else likes it. They've just been giving away three free hours of game time because, you know, once you run out of lives, you're done. That just as a nice little, hey, we know you're stuck at home and we want you to feel good, right? And so just those little tiny moments that make you feel more connected. And I know we all suffer from different things during this. And for mine, it's been isolation. I've been separated from my family for 40 days. Um, and I'm used to having a lot of kids and my partner and um, it's usually mayhem. So, you know, I struggled with that. And it's those little tiny micro moments where it's like, you have something, right? You have somebody there, you have, you have a thing. Um, you know, we have a couple of clients that are in like biodefense and biosecurity and food sanitation. Um, you know, the, the one that's in biodefense, they have a, a, a tool that detects various pathogens that come in through the mail system. And they're fast tracking a product to potentially detect COVID on those surfaces and eventually get into some clinical trials with human. We have a company that does sterilization for agriculture and food safety that just happen to have the ability to create mass amounts of hand sanitizer. They don't sell it, right? They're a massive B2B distribution partner channel um, company and they, and they mobilize to do that. Um, so I, I think that it, it goes back to kind of what I said earlier about like what's that thing that you have and what can you do more of? And are you protecting your nuts or not? And just to kind of name drop a little bit, I think the Foreman Wolf Group has done an incredible job of scaling everything back and they're selling gift cards so that they can buy food for their staff and those those ways of like yes the business is obviously suffering this is a very incredibly busy time for restaurants like february and march is when everyone kind of goes out to eat because the holidays are over and when you can stop and say okay wait how do we take care of our people first i think it's it's, it's heartwarming it, there's so much humanity in that that's a, i want to go to the foreman wolf restaurants as soon as this is over to help support and give that back um because it's, it's that time where you see brands taking care of each other more than they're taking care of themselves. I think that authenticity is, is such an important part of it too, because you are seeing so many of these ads, these, these we're in it together ads. And yet uh, I think the public is getting wise to some of those bigger brands who they may talk a good game, but they have some of the worst records when it comes to employee safety or, paid health care or paid time off. So when someone like McDonald's or Walmart says, hey guys, we're really in this together, uh, I think you're seeing a lot more people call bullshit on that. And that's where that fake authenticity can really bite you. Yeah, that's a good point, Matt. And I think that there's there are people who get it and there are people who don't, right? And it's this idea of we're in it together, but not really ever having any hardships and not knowing what that actually means. And I think it's been interesting, and I'm sure everyone on this call can relate to this, as we've seen that crisis happens and people get divided into the ones that jump in and just start doing stuff, right, to help and to fix and putting on great 
you know, conferences like this and those that are, you know, sitting back and, and looking for pity or saying that, you know, we're in it together and talking the talk, but not really doing anything. Um, and the unfortunate part of that is the ones that are talking about it get the most visibility, but there's not really any substance behind it. But if you really look, and it's not hard to do in Baltimore specifically because this community is so strong, um, that the ones that are jumping in, like Mira Kitchen Collective, who's you know a group of immigrant women who are refugees and they're cooking for the community that's, that's accepted them in, you know, it's like these little underdog pockets of, of brands that are that are doing such great work that are really saving the day. Meanwhile, McDonald's is going, we got this, <laughs> right? So um, it, it's it's not hard to find. I mean, we all can sense authenticity, and you're right, Matt. Like calling that bullshit, it's real easy when you see that there's there's no power behind the words. I think I think one of the things that throughout this entire thing that has been resonating with me, and you guys are kind of touching upon it, is um, is leadership, right? Like it really kind of shows um, on on a number of scales, whether it's political, business related, whatever. How are leaders showing up? How is leadership coming through? And I think it's shining a big light on those who do it really well and those who are falling a little short. With that, uh, we have a really great question from Aaron coming in. Um, Ashleen, maybe I'll direct it to you at first, but I implore everybody if you want to jump in. What are you guys seeing, suggesting, when it comes to how leaders communicate during this time, both internally and externally? That is a really good question. So this has been a, a challenge because every client, brand, um, you know, company person has their own leadership style and communication style. And so I think we just go back to our, our basics in terms of what we advise our clients to do. And even what we've been advising, you know, for Planet to be doing is to be open and honest, to share as much factual information as we can, even, even when, you know, we don't have all the details yet, just, we don't want our, our employees or our clients or, you know, anyone to ever feel like we're holding back information that could have been, um, you know, good for their health to know, or like kept them safe or kept their family safe. We want to share as much information as possible um, in a clear and concise way. The other thing that we always go back to is just show show care, you know, show empathy, show feelings and emotions in your message. Um, you know, if you're communicating that an employee is sick, it's not just about, you know, oh, we're closing the store, we're cleaning and, and you know, we're contacting people who've been in, it's our employee is sick. We're making sure that they're in good care. We're making sure that they're still getting paid, you know, like getting those messages out and showing how you're caring for the, uh, for the people, um, whether that's your customers or your employees. Um, showing care and empathy goes a really long way and can really help, you know, keep your reputation intact when you don't, when nothing else is going for you, if you act in a responsible way and you show that you actually care, um, that can make all the difference. Yeah. I mean, I think caring is a huge part, right? I mean, especially during these times, we all feel like we, you know, are, are both you know, looking for caring from other people, empathy, whatever that is, but then also looking to extend that to, to people, um, you know, when needed. Do you guys, you know, is, is everybody else um, kind of feeling the same way? Does anybody else have anything that they want to jump in on that? Because that it's kind of a big question, I think, like in terms of how leaders are showing up during these times. I think one of the things, um, even looking within the industry at large and seeing some of the I mean, there are some creative leaders, some prominent agencies who are in a much different place than they were a few months ago and are now on their own job searches. And it's been interesting to watch those folks showcase a level of vulnerability that makes them, I think, feel human all of a sudden. For, for those of us who've been kind of idolizing and watching them from afar, I think seeing some of that vulnerability has been tremendous. And it's a little bit of a sense of relief, right, for our day to day. Um, to see that come through and that, that sense of humanity, I think, that you see in some of these leaders has been, has been really fantastic. One of the things that uh, I've noticed is uh, um, there's been a lot of transparency tests with companies, right? Like transparency with your employees, transparency with the public. One of our clients is a, is a senior living facility, uh, 65 locations across the country, and um, they're noticing that a lot of their competitors so, so they get a lot of their business from move-ins, like a, a senior 
goes to the hospital, they break their hip, and then um, somebody there facilitates them being moved into a, into one of their uh, one of their homes. And so, um, but there's a choice of which home you get moved into. So a lot of their business is like comes from there. And uh, one of the questions that they get is, how many cases of COVID-19 do you have at your facility? And so their competitors have taken the approach of um, not, you have to dig for the answer. Whereas uh, we, you know, we've never been big into the creating animated GIF world, but we made like 54 animated GIFs that they could text out with the number, it's, it's, it said COVID transparency, how many cases they have at each facility, and, um, and whether, you know, whether they're accepting move-ins for each one. And I, you know, in talking with the, the CEO, it was, it was, you know, I, I had both admiration for him because he just hit it head on. And also there was a little fear in me, you know, for him because, it, you know, that can impact his business, but it's also clearly a great leadership move. I mean, is there other transparency tests that other people are seeing where, you know, like, especially from a PR front, Ashleen. Yeah, I was going to add. So one of our clients made the decision really early on that um, we were just looking at media coverage as, you know, emails were getting leaked that there was like a, an employee who had COVID at a plant or something like that. And, and we were trying to follow the media coverage, like are people putting it out there? What are they doing? How are they doing it? And we noticed early on this trend of the companies that we like respected were being very forthright and now you know we made the decision early on that any company that has the public coming to it that we would advise our clients that we proactively send a statement out to the media saying we had an employee diagnosed this is what we're doing you know go through obviously we show our care and concern in our messaging but that was a show of the leadership that that they are saying you know what we don't care if it if it hurts our business in the short term i think for the long term if we are transparent and honest um, we think our customers will respect respect that and they'll trust us. And building trust and keeping that trust is, you know, the the result of great leadership. And, you know, I think we've seen examples of eroding trust from poor leadership. Um, and I won't get into that <laughs> rabbit hole, but um, I think the really good companies are the ones that are continuing to build and maintain trust with the public and their customers and their employees. I think that's a great point, um, you know, and that I'd love to touch more upon as well too. Josh asked the question, how has this changed how we run our companies, how we care for our own team? So building upon that idea, which is kind of what you're talking about, Ashleen, you know, do you think that this is shining a light on in terms of just how we conduct our day-to-day -day business internally, how we, how we treat our employees and maybe the safety nets that, you know, build up? that we have, that we, sorry, the safety nets that we have constructed. Like, what, what are your thoughts there? Sorry, was that question for me? It's kind of to the group, but you're the one on, on my camera and you're yeah. the last one to answer. So maybe you can kick it off and if someone has something to add, yeah. Yeah, and I think much to Kara's point earlier, I think it was Kara who said that people are becoming even more so who they already are. I think we're seeing the companies who are, who do well by their employees and who do well by their customers are just doing even more so. You know, we've seen, some of our clients stepping up and increasing employee wages during this time and um, you know providing free meals and it's not because we're telling them to do that because it'll get them great PR um, it's because that's who they are and it's baked into their DNA um, I think from a company standpoint when I look at internally at planet I think it 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 exposes how all of our individual needs are so important and unique you know like everyone has their own situation right now that we need to be cognizant of. Some people are home with children. Some people have high risk health conditions, you know, and I think when we don't have either flexible policies or we don't have, you know, work from home, we don't have paid sick leave, things like that in place to protect people. That's when you see people falling through the cracks. Um, when we're not taking care of the, the most high risk people in the population, um, you're going to, you're going to feel that you know, throughout the greater population is, is just this sense of unease and distrust in the greater company, you know, in the greater leadership. All right. Well, we've got, we've got about seven minutes left and I, I want to get to kind of some takeaways and final thoughts from all of our panel. Um, so, you know, Matt, maybe you can kick us off. What, what's something that you uh, would want people to learn walking away from this? Wow. Um, 
I guess there's a couple things, uh, just how fragile an economy can be. It's terrifying that even in some of the times of greatest strength, how quickly it is to, to kick the legs out uh, from under us. Um, I think more than anything though, I've, I've gotten an appreciation of my team. Uh, they've helped to remind me that we can be creative and adaptable on the fly. And then uh, if you've got good people, they'll always find a way to, to do their jobs well. Um, and also I'm learning how much my family hates me with each Zoom call. <laughs> Jess Brown, how about you over at TVC? What, do you, what would you like to uh, you know, impart uh, as people leave? Uh, I guess the one thing uh, from a creative standpoint is just that I think I've seen, um, I don't want to call it the silver lining, I won't go that far, but some really bright spots and the type of thinking um, that my colleagues have brought forward because there is this new focus on humanity and, you know, not that there, there isn't always still going to be that tug of war between data and insights and creative insight and intuition. I, I think what I'm starting to see from a creative perspective, and I love it, is that there is an opportunity for us to talk more openly in larger groups beyond the creative department um, about our consumers and our target audiences where it feels less like they are data points um, and track records and performance metrics and they are more individuals, they are people. Um, they have a lot of things driving their decision and we can't always be in tune with that. So I think for me, you know, that's a big takeaway that there's an interesting creative opportunity that I hope goes beyond just what we're seeing right now. Um, and I think the only other thing, because I feel like I love it when everybody else acknowledges, I, it's okay to not be good at being a teacher and a creative director and a mom and a colleague and a like partner all in one day. Like it's okay, I think, to just maybe be a little bit okay at those things at different points throughout the day, but we don't have to be killing it from nine to five and then from <laughs> five to nine, so. Yeah, I love the fact that the curtain has kind of been pulled back a bit between the separation of work and home. I mean, it's chaotic, but it's also refreshing to see people with kids on their lap and meetings. And I mean, we're all, you know, we all have other lives. And so that's such a refreshing silver lining, I think, in all of this. Carol, what about you? Um, what, you know, what do you think is a great takeaway from this? And does you, based on what you just said, Dave, this idea that, and I'm type A perfectionist, like my life's routined and in a spreadsheet and I'm got to be perfect at everything. I'm the perfect mom, I'm the perfect business, like all these, the micro pressures that I just put on myself personally to hit, um, just to feel okay with myself. Right. And that like, we are in this forced vulnerability that in a strange way, I think has felt, even though we're physically separated it's felt less lonely in a lot of ways because all of our flaws have been revealed and i'm like oh you too that's cool you know so we have a lot of that and i think to echo jess's point that i think we hear this cliche all the time that people in love are the most important things but i think we've kind of been forced to experience that firsthand that nothing is more important than people and nothing is more important than taking care of each other and no matter what industry you're in if it's agency or hospital or if you're in construction it's that's your channeling your medium to serve other people and that really is the meaning of life right and so the more we can start to remove these layers of fear and have that like vulnerability like you said joss and this growth mindset and like hey really missed the mark on that one let's talk it out and figure it out as two humans um so much stress and anxiety and need to be perfect goes away like when you strip away the rules and you have to deal with what's left there's something beautiful that happens just in terms of how we start communicating and working together and collaborating. Um, and so that's something that I've been really honing in personally on. How do I keep that in my heart and in my work and how I interact with other people when this is over? When I don't, when, when the rules are back on and I know there's going to be a new norm, how can I always keep in the center that I love the person that I'm interacting with in that moment. I want to help them. I want them to feel good. And I don't want to have my own senses of not being good enough, the fear of that to trump that experience. And so that's been the takeaway I've been really sitting with. And I, I hope that people get that too, whether it's a brand or a, an interaction with a client, that it's at the end of the day, it's human to human interaction. And that's what's feeling really, really good right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with that hundred percent. And um, with the person that I'm getting the most human to human interaction, Ashleen, um, any takeaways on your end? 
Well, you guys said it all. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but just, you know, it's, it's tough to follow all the great things from, you know, all the experts on this panel. I agree with all of them, Kara, especially about, you know, letting go of that fear. I think it's really important to remember that um, I'd read this you know, meme. It was like, you're not working from home. You are under stay at home orders, trying to work from home during a global pandemic. Like don't give yourself some grace, give everyone some grace, give your clients a little bit of that grace too. You know, I think everyone is open and willing to communicate more, be more understanding right now. Um, like you said, like I've had kids interrupt every single call I've been on, even this one, despite our best efforts. So I just hope when, you know, we go back to normal, we look at what we're adding back in with a new eye, you know, like what do we really miss? And then what can we, what maybe we don't, don't need, you know, and, and that we can kind of have a new normal, but not that we're like rushing to get back to what it was before. Cause I think if we don't learn anything from this, then what the hell was it all for, you know? So I just hope we all come out of it, you know, better and stronger and, and more empathetic. I agree. And Darren, what, what about you? I agree with everything everybody said, um, especially the human stuff. I know that uh, I've done a lot of self-reflection in this time and I've, uh, you know, we've all have, we've all had emotional moments and, you know, just moments of kids interrupting and I, I have kids as well. And it's, uh, it's tough. Um, I think from a business standpoint, um, I think that there's a lot of language, especially at the beginning of, of weathering the storm. And I think that that's almost not the right way to think of it because the storm is gonna be here for however long it takes to get a vaccine. Um, so I, I think that it's a matter of like the brands that are out in the storm, treating it as the new reality, directing traffic with a poncho on are probably um, gonna come out of this a lot stronger than the ones who are operating a fear cutting budgets, uh, laying off before having all the data, um, and who are acting out of fear, right? And I think that, you know, one of the CEOs that is a good client of ours um, used to play in the NFL, and he's got this whole philosophy called hashtag offense. And, um, you know, when you're down by two touchdowns, you need to be making passes and trying things and running different plays. And, I, and that just really resonated with me. And I feel like as a company, we've every day just been working on, you know, not we've, I don't think we've ever talked about, um, let's just kind of hunker down and wait through this. It's always been like, what can we be doing right now to help people and uh, to help our clients? How can we be helpful? And I don't think that, you know, if any, any brands that are authentically giving, it never hurts your bottom line. And I just want to dispel that myth that, you know, um, that if you're generous, it, it somehow, you know, takes away from your resources or whatever. I think being generous every time helps your bottom line, whether it's with your employees or with uh, your clients or anybody at this time. And I think everybody just appreciates the people in the poncho outside in the storm directing traffic, <laughs> you know, especially the first response, you know, uh, the first responders and all of our essential workers. But, you know, for those of us who have, got, who have to keep our lights on. It's just about um, not operating out of fear. And I think that's been a huge lesson for us as a company is um, every day we've just been kind of like rolling up our sleeves and trying to figure out, we've, we've never put on a webinar before. <laughs> right. Um, and it's been a learning experience, but it's been exciting. It's been fun. Um, minus all the terrifyingness and the personal turmoil we're going through. It's been, it's been, it's brought us alive. So I hope that you guys um, get something out of this and can pass it along. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know I learned a lot. I hope everybody else is walking away with a little nugget. I cannot thank our panelists enough. Ashleen, Matt, Kara, Jess, Darren, this has been fantastic. If anybody has additional questions, we don't want to leave you in the, the wings. Please, please, please. You're welcome to send us uh, your questions. We'll make sure they get directed to the right people or you can find, um, you know, everyone's on LinkedIn, I imagine. Uh, they can, you can, you can find them there or you're, you're welcome to contact us and we're, we're uh, happy to connect you directly um, with whoever you're, you're looking for. So guys, thank you everyone. Thanks for taking the time. And um, I 
hope with the bottom of my heart that I get to see all of your beautiful faces in person soon. Um, hugs around if we're allowed to, I don't know. So <laughs> thanks again, everyone. And uh, that's it from here. Thank you guys. Thank you. It's not hard, but I, that would be kind of big.